let's spend some time talking about uh, radiobiology and defining some terms. Um, largely, these deterministic and stochastic effects of radiation. And I just want to try to clarify things as much as possible. Hopefully, we all had a chance to do the reading because um, that will help us kind of move things along with this. Um, and I'll do my best to try to make these terms as clear as possible for us. So here's some of my objectives. Um, you know, I may not have completely updated these objectives. And I did I upload this to... No, I did not. Okay, and the, the big thing here is these objectives, I didn't. I finished this lecture, didn't quite have it. I forgot to update the objectives. There are some additional objectives here. The big, the big thing here is we will be going over all this material, but we're also <laughs> going to compare and contrast deterministic and stochastic effects of radiation. Um, if that, so my big takeaway for you all today is, number one, to for us to have a robust understanding of what the sievert is, why it is so important to understanding radiation dose and discussing radiation dose with the patient, and then also to understand the distinction between a deterministic effect and a stochastic effect of radiation exposure. Those are my two big things that I'm trying to drive at. So we've talked about how Willem, Willem Rankin discovered x-rays 1895, right? It's coming up. We're going to have... Uh, X-ray Appreciation Week next week. This woman is his wife. This is an X-ray of her hand, and when she saw it, she different reports say different things. But I I found somewhere where she said the devil. Um, other reports said she said I've seen my death. Um, she wasn't really positive about it, so I think she's pretty awesome. She's probably the first person to recognize that there could potentially be harmful effects to this stuff until uh, Doctor. Uh, Kasabian, he was a dentist using the x-ray machine for dental x-rays. He started to document these early effects of radiation, these deterministic effects on his hands. Because the x-ray operators, would, they, the tube was not shielded. It was just covered in like cardboard or sometimes uh, uh, wood. Or sometimes it was just an open tube that was just exposed. I think I showed you that scary tube that I'm terrified of. That's what he was playing with. And it, um, it caused him to have cancer in his hand and then what's interesting about it is they ampu they they the body heals from these radiation scars but the healing causes the skin tissue to thicken a lot so much so that the blood vessels can no longer feed blood into that tissue and so he lost fingers due to necrosis right because of the thickening or the hardening of the skin tissue Right, so this is, but this is 19, so just five years after the discovery of x rays, we have the first documents of this stuff affects biological systems. Um, Clarence Daly in 1904 becomes the first radiation casualty um, known of. Now, there probably was some caveman who fell into a uranium cave or something who died of radiation poisoning, but the first documented one is Clarence Daly from working with Thomas Edison on the fluoroscope. Um, uh, Edison would have him hold his hand over this box here while he was working on the development of the machine and daily experienced um, <laughs> acute radiation, early radiation effects that eventually led to his death. 1919, Muller and a number of other scientists worked on irradiating fruit flies. Now, why the heck were they doing that? And you can actually see here is that x-ray tube right here, that same scary x-ray tube. But what does he have it trained on? He's got it trained on a tray right here full of fruit flies and then with a light that allows him to project down and see what's happening to the fruit flies. So it's magnifying the fruit flies. They irradiated thousands, maybe millions of fruit flies, and they did it over courses of generations. Because they were interested, he had read these early reports on how radiation was affecting the somatic tissue of the body. Somatic is just the fancy word for the body, right? So somatic cells are the cells of the body. So the radiation damage to that doctor's hands was somatic damage. Muller said, what if there's genetic damage as well? So genetic cells are those things like sperm and ova that are responsible for the reproduction of the body. 
And so Muller was asking what happens if we irradiate generations of fruit flies, eventually will we have some super fruit fly, right? Or what will happen, will it weaken the cell such that it's passed down from generation to generation and the mutation becomes an inherited trait? Interestingly enough, they didn't track any mutations like that in the fruit fly populations, which led them to some really interesting and still controversial conclusions that perhaps the fruit flies that are here on Earth at this time are the best possible fruit flies that could exist in any possible universe. I think that's a pretty crazy theory, um, because I imagine there's a number of other ways that we can improve on the fruit fly, but, but science has yet to really answer that question of, why were, were these fruit fly populations not significantly mutated from one generation to the next? Nevertheless, it was an established fact that radiation causes biological damage, right? But very little was done with this knowledge until almost half a century after X-ray's discovery with the use of nuclear weapons. Now, I want to point out that, so on, I think... I'm trying to remember which one of these is Hiroshima and which one of them is Nagasaki. Uh, but August 6th and August 9th, 1942, the U.S. deployed nuclear weapons on Japan. Um, the Fat Boy and Little Man, wait, Little Man and Fat Boy bombs. Um, and this wreckage here, I believe, is Hiroshima, and I think this is Nagasaki, the blast radius. The main things that these bombs did was kill people through concussive shock and detonation. So 90% of the energy produced by these bombs was just like TNT. It was an explosive thing just like TNT. But there was 10% of the energy of the bombs that released radioactive materials. Right? So... And it was quite a bit of radioactive materials, right? So iodine-131 would be the big one, cesium-137. These are elements that, though they exist in nature, these radioisotope forms of them had not existed, as far as we know, until people made them, right? So radiation has existed on this planet since the inception of life and even before, but some of these radioisotopes are brand new things, right? Even though the elements are there, like iodine's there on the periodic table, this radioactive form of it was a new thing. Um, this was a very sobering thing. The research that we have about the long-term effects of radiation come from those research populations that I mentioned earlier, over 200,000 people who are affected by radiation levels, um, some of them close to natural background radiation, and some of them quite high. But it's after the use of the nuclear weapons and all the research that followed it that we finally start to see an initiative towards radiation protection. Almost 50 years after the discovery of this stuff, we finally have things like signs saying this area has radioactive materials or this machine produces radiation. We have measuring devices that are standardized measuring devices for measuring radiation and radiation exposure. We have film badges, the development of film badges in 1952 or 1954, um, so the early version of this OSL that we're wearing now. Um, the concern uh, begins to be reported in the scientific community. So again, why do I go back through all of this history? Do I expect you to memorize all these times and dates? No, I don't. I don't expect you, but I want you to understand that part of where we're at right now is being still being influenced by these historic events, right? And the big thing, this is the stuff that I do want you to know and memorize, is what is Alara? What does Alara mean? As low as reasonably achievable. And it has become a legal doctrine, right? It is now employed in courts of law in malpractice and negligence cases involving radioisotopes and x-rays, was this tech, were they performing this procedure using a LARA? It's, it's now a legal term, right? It's a legally binding term. The other thing that impacts a LARA or uh, is a LARA in practice is time, distance, and shielding. That's largely how a LARA is interpreted in the literature. Did the technologist practice the minimization of time, a maximization of shielding, 
and a maximization of distance from the radioactive source. That's how ALARA is applied. Now, I'll ask you this, and this is going to inform kind of our discussion moving forward into sieverts. What is the ethical foundation of radiation risk in diagnostic imaging? Now, that's a fancy question. But when you talk to your patients about why it's okay to get an x-ray, what do we say? What, is, what should inform the way that we're talking to them? What's some of the things that we should inform them? There's no right or wrong answers here. So a patient asks you, why can I get an x-ray? Um, I say because um, you would get the same amount of radiation if you're like on the beach or something. Good. That's good. That's good. Anything else? So that addresses the risks related to it. The risks are about the same as being on the beach. So good job, Ms. Ms. Milam. Other things that should inform the ethical discussion of radiation risks. I use that example that you said. Um, it's like two days, just normal radiation exposure of you walking to class, walking to work, or Great. being outside. Good. No, yeah, that's it. So uh, an x-ray, about the same as, like, so a chest x-ray is like 10 days in the sun, right? 10 days of normal natural background radiation we are exposed to about the same amount of sieverts, same amount of grays as the diagnostic imaging. Both of those examples, the one that Mr. Lanford, Ms. Milam gave us, relate to the risk, right? But I want to suggest that there's another thing that, that we should be talking about. We should be talking about the benefits of diagnostic imaging as well. So the main ethical stance is benefits versus risks, costs versus risks, costs versus benefits, I'm sorry. This is the main way, the foundation of all discussion about diagnostic imaging is there are benefits to it. It lets me know if you've broken your bone. Are there risks? Could it cause cancer? Unfortunately, yes. <coughs> right? So there's a benefit there. Let's me know if whether or not you're having a, a bleed in your brain, right? Which is a significant benefit. Is there a risk? Yes, 50 years from now, you could have cancer from this exam. But wouldn't it be a, a cumulative effect, not just that one chest x-ray that caused that? Interestingly enough, it is not a cumulative effect, at least according to our current models of it. Although a lot of government and scientific bodies treat it as though it were a cumulative effect, and we'll talk about why that is in just a sec. That's a really good question, though. ICRP basic tenets. Now, the International uh, Commission or Committee on Radiation Protection is probably my favorite of these committees that's creating suggestions for how we should protect ourselves from this stuff. Our government and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, does not always adopt everything that the ICRP suggests, right? And one of the main ones that they have yet to adopt is this discussion of justification, optimization, and dose limitation. So this is another way of thinking about that benefits versus risks scenario. This is just kind of a more robust way of talking about it. So, like I said earlier, man is suspected of having a bleed in his head. Can we justify doing a CT on his head? Yes, we can. There is a life-threatening condition that he has that we need to figure out what's going on in order to treat it. Now that we've decided this is a justified procedure, looking at the benefits and the risks, knowing these same benefits and risks, let's optimize the dose. Let's do the right kind of exam that will help us diagnose this condition with the least amount of radiation. Right? And one of the ways that optimization sometimes is talk, talked about is, and justification sometimes is talked about as best test first. We will do the best test first. We will justify and do the best test first, right? What do you mean by best test first? Good question. So say I have a choice between examinations that I could do for this man who's having a bleed in his head. I have a choice with can I do the CT or the MRI, right? The MRI could potentially show me the bleed, but it takes 45 minutes to do an MRI. It takes me two minutes to do the CT. So 
the CT winds up being the best test because of that time constraint. It can do it quicker. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So best test first is the way that the doctors, these people who are doing um, emergency medicine think about it. Okay? And it also helps us understand, okay, this is why I need to do this procedure now. So optimization can be thought of as doing it with the least amount of radiation. Getting the best pictures with the least amount. So the best, the best test with the least of dose. Best test, least dose. Optimization then is the best test with the least dose. And the way that we will employ optimization is we will do dose limitation, right? So we will limit to the area that we need to do pictures in. We will limit the amount of radiation used as much as possible. We will employ shielding. All of these things considering at each step the benefits and the risks of radiation use. So justification, optimization, and dose limitation are the ICRP basic tenets. All right, well, let's talk about what the heck we mean when we talk about radiation dose. Now, unfortunately, we'll look and we'll see this is reported in milliram. This is old data, right? But we haven't gotten a new report out on this, right? Um, but we can, um, we can convert this, right? We have the power to convert milliram to sieverts, right? And so if we say it's um, 600 milliram, 610 milliram, how many rev is that? Yep, 0.61 rem. And I said my way of knowing how to convert is... Rad equals centigrade, right? So for our purposes now, we'll do the exact same thing for converting rim to sieverts. So if I say that this equals 0.61 centisievert, but I said we seldom use the centisievert. We don't like the centisievert for whatever reason. So we'll go ahead and say it's 6.1 millisieverts is what we're talking about. So I want you to do, if you're looking, if you're tracking along on the slides, go ahead and scratch out 610 millirem. That unit is obsolete. What we're talking about is 6.1 millisieverts. This is, according to this report, which is NCRP report number 160, this is the most recent data on the average collective effective dose for United States citizens. That's a fancy way of saying this is about what everyone gets every year. This is about what everyone gets every year. So if you look here, 37% of the U.S. public's exposure to radiation is radon gas. 37% of our exposure is radon gas. In fact, what's interesting is we can kind of divide this thing. Let me see if this has it in a nice, neat way. If we divide this right here, on this side over here, we have all the natural background radiation. All the stuff that's just out there like solar cosmic rays, internal background, like from eating a banana, um, and then radon and thoron and gases like that. This side is all the man-made stuff. And the big shock of NCRP report number 160 was the chunk of dose that came from computed tomography. Even though computed tomography is not the most common exam done, it contributes significantly to our overall dose. Um, but I want to point out the big, big thing here is about 
about three millisieverts comes from natural sources, comes from nature, and about three millisieverts comes from artificial or man-made sources, right? Of which diagnostic imaging is the big culprit. So nature hasn't changed. Since the dawn of time, natural background radiation has been about three millisieverts. What has changed since, largely since the late 1970s forward is the amount of man-made radiation and the number one culprit right now is medical imaging. So let's talk about, now that we kind of have all that background, we can talk about what exactly radiation biology is. It is the study of the sequence of events following the absorption of energy from ionizing radiation, the efforts of any organism to compensate, and the damage to the organism that might be produced by that radiation. Okay? So it deals with absorption of energy, compensation efforts, and damage. Absorption of energy, compensation efforts, and damage. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the biology part of it right now. Because honestly, talking about cells and DNA and all those kinds of things, I think that will overwhelm us for this class. We'll have plenty of time to talk about the biology parts of it um, next fall. But what I do want us to come away with is a deep understanding of why we like the sievert so much. Okay? Can you tell us those three ways you can... Um, yeah. So biology, the radiobiology is going to be the absorption of energy, compensation efforts by the organism, so the way it repairs damage, and then the damage, the actual damage it sustains. That definition is not in our textbook. It comes from a radiation, bio, a radiation therapy textbook. Um, so it's, it's worth looking at that um, on the PowerPoint. The way that we get to Sieverts is we have to first understand something about radiation types. And when I say radiation types, I'm using a very specific language. Okay? Radiation types, x-rays are one type of radiation, one type of ionizing radiation. Okay? Gamma rays are a lot like x-rays. The only thing that they differ in is their source. So when I use radiation source, I'm also using very specific scientific language. The source of an x-ray is inside of an x-ray tube. The source of a gamma ray is from within a radioisotope. It's part of nuclear decay. So x-rays and gamma rays are the exact same thing. They are both photons. Where they differ is in their source. But they are the same type of radiation. A different type of radiation is a neutron. Some radioactive elements, when they decay, they give off neutrons. And so neutrons are a different type of radiation. And then a final type of radiation would be alpha particles. Alpha particles are basically a um, helium nucleus. What do I mean by that? It is a helium atom minus any electrons, and it is literally ejected out of another atom. It is part of radioactive decay to eject alpha particles, and they have a tremendous amount of energy. So these different types of radiation have different types of interacting with biological tissue, and the way that we'll talk about that is linear energy transfer. So this is a measure of energy transferred or deposited by ionizing radiations as they travel through biologic tissue. So x-rays and gamma rays have one type of linear energy transfer. Alpha particles have a totally different kind of linear energy transfer, and that's important. So let's look at why that's important. The alpha particles will directly interact with a target. And the target in question typically when we're talking about radiation biology is DNA. 
DNA is really a very, very small part of the body's weight or even one cell's weight, right? It's a very, very small part of a cell's weight. So it is only these high LET radiations that have um, the ability for direct interaction with, with DNA. So sometimes we call that its let. So I'm going to write direct action high let. Versus indirect action, this is low let, low linear energy transfer radiations. And what happens is instead of inter directly impacting the DNA, it interacts with a water molecule. Because, again, 80 to 85 percent of any cell's weight is water. It's like cytoplasm and the protoplasm of the cell. Um, and the chances of just by basic statistics, the chance of something interacting with water, if it's 85% of it's water, is much higher. So when the radiation hits a water molecule, it can destroy that water molecule and produce free radicals, as well as potentially something like um, hydrogen peroxide, which is cytotoxic. Hydrogen peroxide literally eats the cell apart, destroys the cell from the inside. We will call that an indirect interaction because it killed the cell's DNA, but it did it through the water. So again, I mentioned that the high LET is more likely to cause a direct interaction, right? And the reason for that is these high LET X, uh, radiations give off all their energy very, very quickly. So, for example... If an alpha particle was traveling through a cell, it would be going energize, 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 and it would be causing all sorts of ionization events as it travels through the cell. And that's precisely what we have illustrated here. This is an alpha particle moving through a cell, causing all these ionization events, until eventually it just gives off all of its energy right here and stops. So interestingly enough, an alpha particle could be stopped by my shirt. If there's alpha particle contamination in a radioactive spill area, I'm fine as long as I don't inhale the stuff or somehow get it inside of my body, right? Because it gives off all of its energy so quickly. And we will call that high let. Versus photons, x-rays, gamma rays, they are low let. And so as this x-ray transverses the cell, it says energize, 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 energize. And eventually it just goes off. It continues on its way. You know, Compton scattering off of one atom after the other. But it does not deposit all of its energy very quickly. So an x-ray can penetrate my entire body and maybe only ionize a few things in my body. And we'll call that low linear energy transfer. This is a point that we'll come back to again because it gets flipped around inside of folks' head all the time. It happened to me. But the big takeaway here is the low let energy can go further. You would think with a name like low let that wouldn't be the case. But low let, because it doesn't give off much of its energy, can go further. The alpha particles, the high let stuff, they don't go very far. They give off all of their energy and stop. So this discussion of free radical production that's in our textbook is important because this is the number one way that the x-rays that we take of people are probably going to affect their body. It's through the production of free radicals in water. Right? I'll say that again. X-rays are low let. The number one thing that they're going to do in the human body is produce free radicals. And those free radicals can then cause damage to the cell or to the DNA. Here's a graphical illustration of free radical production by a beta particle interaction. So it ionizes this molecule, 
which creates an ion pair. And now we have a hydrogen ion and a hydroxyl free radical. Now these hydroxyl free radicals can either be positively charged or negatively charged depending on the way that they occur. And it's possible they could recombine and just form another water molecule. Or these two guys here could recombine and form hydrogen peroxide, which again erodes the cell, destroys the cell. It's cytotoxic. So knowing all of this about the high let and the low let x-rays and things like that, we need to say that different types of radiation have different kinds of biological effects. And that is what an RBE is. Okay? So our first step in understanding sieverts is understanding that different types of radiation have different types of biologic effects. Okay? Now after saying all of that stuff, right, I will just say two things about this. As LET increases, RBE increases. So if I have a high LET, I will have a high RBE. Okay? But the good news is, with all of this discussion of this stuff, is for x-rays, the RBE equals 1. The RBE equals 1. So, what this means is, if I just want to understand um, an equivalent dose of x-rays, gray equals sievert. Gray will equal sievert completely. If all I'm talking about is an equivalent dose of x-rays, I can directly convert gray to sievert because the RBE is 1. So I would take the dose in gray, like say the, gross, the dose was uh, 20 centigray, I would multiply it by this RBE of 1, which equals um, 20, well we said we don't like to use centisieverts, right? But we'll say 200 millisieverts. So now we have an actual patient dose. All right, we started out with, with something that was similar to an exposure. We've changed, we've given it a biological factor, and we've now got an expression of patient dose. Now there are different other things that influence patient dose. For example, there are chemical factors, like an oxygen enhancement ratio. This means that if the cell is hypoxic, if it doesn't have much oxygen, it will not have much of a response to radiation. It will have a decreased ra radio sensitivity. If it is a hypoxic cell, it will have a decreased radio sensitivity. If it is a fully oxygenated cell, it will be more sensitive to radiation. And that's all these illustrations are showing us, is here we have different dose amounts down here, and then we have different responses here, and we can see this hypoxic cell has less of a response than this cell that is well oxygenated or aerated. So we'll call that an oxygen enhancement ratio. It is just a chemical factor in cells responses. So we talked about how there is types of radiation. So there's physics involved in, in the biological response. Now I'm saying there's also chemi chemistry involved in this biological response. And I've already kind of hinted at this, but what we're really driving at is a deep, deep understanding of the sievert and patient dose, because this dose number is really the best way of understanding and the best way of communicating what exactly we would affect, act, expect to happen after radiation exposure. So we've got an absorbed dose, right? An absorbed dose. And we've said that's going to be expressed in gray. So we had some kind of exposure up here, let's say. We had an exposure up here. And that might be in like joules per kilogram, which we've said is equivalent to gray, equals gray. 
And as we made that exposure, this is what hit the patient, right? What does that mean in terms of their dose? And the way that we're going to arrive at that dose number is first we will say it, it equivalent. So let's say that for some reason they were exposed to an alpha particle emitter and a gamma ray and a number of different things. We've got to equalize all those different kinds of radiation types. And so that's that first equivalent dose. So that's the gray <coughs> times a weighting factor, which we've said is the RBE. But we said that that RBE for x-rays, thank God, is 1, right? And this will be expressed in sieverts now. So now our equivalent dose will be given to us in sieverts by just saying, okay, this was an x-ray, so times 1, so gray equals sieverts. Good news. Now, if we want to talk about an effective dose, this is where things get actually kind of complicated for us as x-ray techs. Because now we're saying, how does this affect the body? And the weird thing about that is every tissue in your body, every tissue in the human body, has a different dose response. And that's going to be the biological part of this. This is why there are scientists who dedicate their career to understanding this. We don't need to be those scientists, thank God, right? But the big thing here is we'll have some dose. If we want to know what an effective dose is, we need to know the, the absorbed dose. And we're going to multiply that by a weighting factor, which we said is the RBE. So I'm just going to write that as a weighting factor for the radiation. So just a fancy way of writing that. And we're going to multiply that by a weighting factor for the tissue. And now we have an effective dose. The point here is that one of the reasons why it is so difficult to talk to our patients about a dose from radiation is that radiation affects every single cell in their body differently. And we are talking about a lot of interactions. So again, the best way to talk about the patient about this stuff is to talk about both the benefits and the risks, okay? Rather than taking them down this crazy rabbit trail that I've taken you down to understand really what a dose is. Okay, so switching gears just a little bit, let's look under the microscope at what all these little tiny billions of interactions look like. So from a DNA point of view, we're talking about x-rays interacting with DNA typically indirectly, so creating free radicals that then bombard the DNA and destroy parts of the DNA. And the DNA can repair itself quite efficiently. Every single cell in your body has upwards of 200 DNA breaks every year. Every single cell in your body has upwards of 200 DNA breaks every year. It has repair mechanisms in place designed to repair those DNA, that DNA damage. And x-rays aren't the only things that are breaking those cells. Um, there can be base damage. And so that's things like adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine are destroyed within the DNA through an indirect process. And that can cause loss or change of that, D that base, that base pair in the DNA. We can have a single strand break. So the, um, the sugar phosphate chain that forms the sides of the ladder of the DNA, a single side of it could be broken. And that's what we have illustrated here with a single strand break. So one side of the ladder got broken. We could also have a double strand break. Both sides of the ladder are broken. And this is where things get kind of dangerous because now it could translocate. DNA could start to recombine in weird ways, and any one of these things we would refer to as a mutation. The big fancy word for all of this stuff, except for repair, is mutation. So let's look at what that looks like at the chromosome level. So we're just 
we were kind of, we've moved out on our microscope, we've moved up a level, and now we're looking at chromosomes. And specifically, these are chromosomes in the M phase of mitosis. This is when we can study the effects of x-rays, radiation on, D, on chromosomes is during the M phase. So they'll expose cells to radiation, they'll freeze the cells when they hit the M phase, and now we can look at them under the microscope and do this kind of photography where we take pictures of the chromosomes and we see some weird stuff. Um, one of the things that we see is this ring effect where the chromosome has become sticky and it's reconnected with itself and made a ring. Another thing, we call these fragments here. Um, it's not illustrated on this slide, but according to my understanding, the literature that's out, out there right now, the, the most dangerous form of chromosome damage we will call dicentric. Typically, chromosomes have a single centromere, but with with this DNA damage that can occur from high let radiation, we could potentially create a chromosome that it ain't an X chromosome and it ain't a Y chromosome anymore. It is a dicentric chromosome. It has two centromeres, um, and we do not yet fully understand what could potentially happen with this inside of human systems. Now, We've talked quite a bit about how this affects DNA and chromosome and stuff like that. But bear in mind, radiation damage can occur to other parts of the cell as well. So it could affect the cell membrane. It, it could disrupt the cell membrane such as the cell just basically runs out of itself, right? The, the protoplasm runs out of the membrane. Um, it could affect the mitochondria, which destroys the ability of the cell to produce energy, right? Or it could rupture a lysome. The lysomes are those digestive elements of the cell. Sometimes biologists refer to them as suicide bags because if the DNA ruptures a lysome, it's going to spill out that acidic content it has inside of it, and that acidic content will destroy the cell. So this would be radiation effects on other cell components. What happens to these cells after they've been irradiated? Some of them have no damage. Some of them are able to repair themselves. They go on just fine. Some of them are kind of sent reeling, and they're like, whoa, what was that? Let's slow down here and kind of delay on this whole mitosis thing, and maybe we can figure out what the heck just hit us, right? So we will call that division delay or mitotic delay. When the cell understands that it just has received shock, and it delays mitosis in order to initiate repair processes. So these things are smart. Um, it could occur during interphase and just produce death within interphase. Now for most cells, interphase is its most radioresistant phase. For most cells, interphase is the most radioresistant phase. Um, so it is dose dependent, and a lot of the numbers that we get about dose are related to the interphase radio resistance of the cell. It could initiate reproductive failure, so it delays mitosis for so long it does not reproduce. And sometimes they just, um, within the uh, interphase death, we have a term apoptosis, right? It's the fancy word for programmed cell death. The cell says, something bad has happened. I don't know what it is, but I know I shouldn't reproduce myself, right? Because I could be cancer now. I don't think cells actually think about themselves that way, but maybe they do. Um, to that point, looking at things at a cellular level, this is probably the number one way that we will talk about radiation dose is at the cellular level, and we'll talk about different types of tissue and the way that radiation affects those tissues. Um, we have the law of Bergoni and Trivando, which came out in 1906. So we had this pretty early on. And uh, there was one other scientist that worked with them. But what they found was the cells that are the most radiosensitive, that respond the, the most 
uh, to radiation are cells that are actively proliferating, that are highly metabolic, that are undifferentiated, and they are well nourished, like they have lots of oxygen and lots of sugar. So highly proliferating, highly metabolic, undifferentiated, and well nourished. And this is actually good, good news, especially for people who have cancer, because this is precisely the reason why we treat cancer with radiation, because cancer is actively proliferating, highly metabolic, undifferentiated typically, and it's, it loves to be nourished. Right? So this, is the, this principle informs our understanding of radiation biology, the law of Burgundy and Trubendeau, and also informs why we do radiation therapy. So here is a chart, a very kind of generic chart, of radiosensitivity. When I use that word, I'm talking about radio, how, how much will the cell respond to a radiation exposure. And so we have things that are radioresistant and things that are radiosensitive. So be very careful when you're taking tests to make sure you understood. Did the question ask me for radiosensitive or radioresistant? Right? Because, um, for example, radiosensitive cells, things like lymph glands, bone marrow, leukocytes, and immature sex cells. Right? So like spermatogonia. Less radiosensitive than that, a little less radiosensitive is things like the skin and the lens of the eye. But you'll see when we talk about early radiation effects, we're talking about the sensitive side of things, right? Because these are the things that are first impacted by radiation. The radioresistant stuff is things like your brain, nerve cells, muscle cells. The liver is, is less uh, radiosensitive. And then also things like mature sex cells. So like sperm are going to be more radioresistant than um, the immature sex cells. So let's look at the cell survival curve real quick, and then we'll take a little break to do some activities, okay? But cell survival curve describes the relationship between a dose and the percentage of that population of cells that will survive the dose based on experimental data. So a lot of it is like them irradiating mice and then looking at the different types of tissue in the mice and extrapolating that to human populations. Some of this experimental data is ethical. Some of this experimental data is unethical, right? So some of the material that we've got that tells us about this stuff, the data was got in unethical ways. Some of that was even done by the United States government. Right? Um, so, for example, I have a big, thick book in my office called The Human Radiation Experiments that was released by um, President Clint Bill Clinton's administration that details all the secret government experiments that were done on U.S. citizens from about 1940 something to 1972. So, they secretly injected radiopharmaceuticals into civilian populations fed radioactive materials to children, gave uh, plutonium to cancer, victim, to cancer patients. They did some crazy stuff, and they were not telling people what they were doing. And these were government-funded scientific experiments, right? I'm not saying the government did it. I'm saying they paid scientists to do it, right? Um, and then they looked at all that data. The Nazis also did radiation experiments. Right? So some of the data that we have about the effects of radiation on cells comes from Nazi experiments. That was on Holocaust victims, right? Yeah. Okay. And communists and gays. And all, and the, is there any legal implications from that when that book came out? They tried to make some reparations to family members of survivors, but it was pretty minimal. I mean, the, the, the ongoing thing is that we start to see laws now that have shifted the decision-making process from the doctor to the patient. So policy now favors the patient. Do you choose to have this exam done, understanding that there's benefits and risks? So if that happened now, it'd be like lots of uh, suing going on. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I guess... I guess malpractice. Those are different times. I mean, I... I
So, uh, but basically these cell survival curves, what we've understood from all these experiments is that there's two mechanisms broadly for the cell death. It could be a lethal single hit, so an acute effect, or it could be the accumulation of multiple sublethal effects resulting in death. So here at the here at the cellular level is evidence of a cumulative effect of radiation exposure, okay? But that's just for a single cell. It's not like for the entire organism. And the way we, we, the way we crunch these numbers is we have this grim kind of statistic that we call the lethality essay. Now, this is not just for radiation. Again, this is for everything. This is for um, gasoline. This is for the cleaning products. They all have some kind of LD5030. And what that means is the lethality to 50% of the population within 30 days of exposure. I'll say that again. The lethality to 50% of the population within 30 days of exposure. What kills 50% of the people in, in a month is an LD5030. And a lot of times we put it in this fancy curve here. Now what I want to point out, and we'll get into this a little bit more in just a moment, but when I zoom in on this thing, what we see is, again, we still have these old, pesky, traditional units here, right, of rads. And we said that a rad was equal to what? 1, 1 centigrade. So 100 rads at roughly 1 gray is what this is saying. At roughly 1 gray of exposure right, we start to see these lethality effects creep in. And they accelerate exponentially to an LD5030. This is the point at roughly 3 gray. If, if a population is exposed to 3 gray of radiation, which is a huge amount of radiation, 50% um, of them will be dead within 30 days. Now, what happens here, we have a shoulder to this curve because you can't kill more than 100% of a population, right? Um, so that's just, that's just statistics there. The significant thing for us is this number 3 gray and around 1 gray because these are thresholds. We are working well below these thresholds in diagnostic imaging. We're working well below these thresholds in diagnostic imaging. Because I said, what did I say was roughly the population's collective effective dose from x-rays and diagnostic imaging and all that kind of stuff. Do you remember what I wrote on the slide? Three millisieverts? Right. So I said that the population's exposure in general to diagnostic imaging was three millisieverts. So just so we understand what we're talking about here and we understand like why we can say this stuff is safe. Um, what is the relationship between that millisieverts and gray? We said it's just a weighting factor that's between them. So I could also express this as what amount of gray? Three millisieverts could be what amount of gray? I'm going to have a zero out front. Zero point what? How do I convert like millisieverts to sieverts, in other words? Yeah. So I'll move the decimal point two over. So zero, zero, three. Right? Good work. Gray, roughly. That's what we're working with in diagnostic imaging. Okay? So we're well, 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 well below this threshold. Okay? We're well below these uh, the lethality amounts. So, I've got some activities. So, okay, early effects versus late effects. So, in general, biologic effects of radiation that occur relatively soon after the radiation exposure, we're going to call those early effects, it normally is exposure to a high amount of radiation. Um, and it's not common in diagnostic imaging. Pretty much the only early effect that we will see is like skin burns from fluoroscopy. Um, late effects. There's two different types. There's a deterministic late effect and stochastic late effects. And this is after radiation has been delivered for a long time or a long time after an acute dose. 
So early deterministic effects, they're called deterministic, sometimes they used to be called non-stochastic, but I think deterministic is easier because it's determined by the amount of radiation. Um, and it has a threshold or a point after which we start to see the effect. Prior to that threshold, there's no effect. So here's what we're talking about, and this should look a little similar to our LD5030 curve, right? Because we have a threshold, like in the LD5030, we set of a threshold of about one gray. And beyond that, the amount of the effect will be determined by the amount, the dose of radiation. So that is a threshold nonlinear dose response, okay? And that is largely these early radiation effects. These early deterministic effects normally happen within minutes, hours, or days. Um, it requires quite a bit of radiation. And the, the two big culprits for this in our field are probably radiation therapy, interventional radiography. So what we're talking about is skin effects for those modalities. This is an image of a woman who had... Uh, skin burns, you can actually see the pattern of the dress that she was wearing after the nuclear bomb went off. So we'll call this radiation dermatitis, which can be like cancerous lesions. Epilation, which is the fancy uh, uh, word for loss of hair, right? And then desquamination, actually kills the, um, the stem cells of the uh, epithelial tissue such that a few days later, almost like a sunburn, the, the skin starts to die because the skin cells replenish themselves so often. Hematologic effects, like we illustrated on our dose chart, a whole body radiation dose of 0.25 gray, so that would be how many centigrade? 25 centigrade in tissue would produce a measurable hematologic depression. This is within the range of CT scanning. So after CT scanning, there's research coming out now that shows a depression in leukocytes. CT kills white blood cells. Then we have these really wonderful things. Once you get over that threshold of one gray, and here it is again, one gray, we have ARS, these would be acute radiation syndromes. They used to be called acute radiation sicknesses, but the proper term for it is acute radiation syndrome, or ARS. This is going to be anything over doses of one gray or more, which is considerably more than what we do in diagnostic imaging. So, so I just want to briefly move through this stuff. But we have hematologic GI and ultimately a cerebrovascular syndrome that can be caused by large doses of radiation. These syndromes typically follow this pattern of a prodromal or shock phase, followed by a latent period where nothing much happens, then manifest illness and death. So the way that we tip, I encourage students to remember this is we've got prodromal, latent, manifest, and death so please let me die or recover, right? Please let me die or recover is a good way to remember the phases of radiation syndromes. All you need to know at this time is that there are these phases. We'll talk about why this is important next fall. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, let's talk about the late effects. Right, because these are the ones that could be affecting us as x-ray techs. So I said the early effects don't impact us. These late effects are what we need to worry about. This is carcinogenesis. Right, that's scary. Cataractogenesis, so the development of cataracts. And then embryotologic effects, so birth defects. Now I want to point out that these two are random. That's what stochastic means. The fancy word stochastic means random. That's just the statistical way of talking about it. So it's a coin toss. Every time I'm exposed to radiation, I toss the coin. 
The cataractogenesis is a deterministic late effect. So you hit a threshold, and after that we would expect to see cataracts. But for these stochastic effects, right, and this is the best I can do to answer Hunter's question from earlier, we, science, has accepted a linear, non-threshold model. And you'll see this in the literature where it says, or even, I've even heard news anchors say this, no amount of radiation is safe. No amount of radiation is safe. That is a highly controversial statement. Science does not necessarily agree with that. But it is the accepted model of risk for these late effects, these stochastic effects, these random effects like cancer and birth defects, is that any amount of radiation could contribute to cancer or birth defects. That is the, and we, we like this model, and in other words, because it's saying there's no safe dose, it is a very conservative model. So it's saying let's limit our exposure as much as possible. Whether or not that's true, that, to be debated. Carcinogenesis. So cancer is the most important late stochastic effect caused by exposure to ionizing radiation. It is the most important. Right? It has a random occurrence and it does not just seem to have any kind of threshold. And cancer is cancer. So there's, it's not like cancer is worse than cancer. You know what I mean? Like cancer is as bad as it gets. So we can't talk about severity of it. Right? So the severity of it's not dose related. Here's some examples from history of radiation induced cancer that kind of caused people to wake up. Radium watch dial painters, so women who were painting glowing images on watches. And in fact, to this day, if you have a watch that has glow in the dark stuff on it, it some of that is a radioisotope, right? They're using much less radioactive radioisotopes than radium. Radium serious business. Um, but uranium miners were early radiation of, of, um, cancer deaths. Um, a lot of them were Navajo people, so that's a unique population. Um, early radiation workers, so we looked at the radiologist's hands, things like that. Um, Cancer-related patients who were ingested, injected with a contrast agent that was radioactive. Um, infants treated with radiation to treat like enlarged thymus glands, um, children of the Marshall Islands who were exposed to radiation for nuclear bombs tests. There were over 2,000 nuclear bombs tests done in the 1960s, and they contributed a lot to radioisotopes. Um, of course, the Japanese bomb survivors, as well as folks like people who are exposed to the effects of Chernobyl. In each one of those populations, we have been able to chart deterministic effects, carcinogenesis, that we have linked back to that radiation exposure. So here's a particularly nasty-looking uh, carcinoma of the distal arm that someone suffered after severe radiation burns. So let's talk about how do we estimate the risks for cancer. So it may cause cancer as a late stochastic effect. I said that's a random process. And at high doses, the risk is measurable in exposed human populations. Um, at the lower doses, like doses below the 0.1 sievert range, which is where we are as occupational workers, we do not have a model. But we just assume that the line continues down in a linear fashion. So why do we do that? The risks are overshadowed by the risks of cancer caused by everything else that we do. You know, um, from cleaning our house to putting gas in our car to standing next to someone who's smoking a cigarette, every single one of those is a stochastic cancer risk. Um, and then it is possible that at times the risk is zero. We don't know that. But there may be certain kinds of cancer that simply aren't caused by radiation. We just can't make that. We don't have the science yet. We don't have the data yet to, to establish that. <laughs>
So what are we talking about? We're talking about absolute risk versus relative risk, okay? Absolute risk is a scientific model that says, okay, there's some amount of exposure, and after the person receives that exposure, we would expect this additional amount of risk between like the spontaneous incidence of cancer and an excessive amount. So people get leukemia, people get cancer, right? How much more cancer does radiation create? Sometimes what we're talking about is an absolute risk. And that means that it is an additional amount, it, the curve runs parallel to the already present risk of car carcinogenesis. There is also a relative risk model. And in this case, you can see as the dose increases, the risk also increases, right? What we're finding is that different kinds of cancer follow different kinds of risk models, okay? But just be familiar with these two different types. There's an absolute risk model. I know that he goes into some great detail on this in our textbook later on. But the big takeaway here is absolute risk is just an excessive incidence that mirrors exactly the already present risk versus a relative risk actually can inflate. So what did we see, for example, with leukemia incidence? So we said that leukocytes are incredibly radiosensitive. They're among the most radiosensitive cells in the body. A CT scan can cause measurable depression of leukocytes, white blood cells, in the body. Radiation therapy treatments, they have to monitor white blood cell counts because if they kill too many white blood cell counts with the radiation, they could potentially cause infection in the patient, right? So where did we get that data? How do we know that? Well, it comes from these studies of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is ethical data that they got where we see a spike in the absolute risk of leukemia incidence in this population after exposure to the radiation. Leukemia went up. And then it went back down to normal levels. And then what happened is all other types of cancer started to increase after some period of time. So this is probably the most convincing data that we have that links radiation exposure to cancer. So it indicates there's a chance of contracting leukemia as a result of exposure to radiation, and this is assumed to follow a linear non-threshold model, a linear non-threshold dose response. And again, that means that no amount of radiation is safe. The model looks like this. As soon as we start exposing you to radiation, the risk of getting cancer is present. Let's talk about cataract genesis. So I'm switching gears a little bit because we said that this is a deterministic late effect. So there's going to be some threshold of approximately 2 gray. And this is where Hunter's right. This is a cumulative amount. So a person who works in fluoro every single day and who's out there in the primary beam should be wearing those ridiculous lead goggles that are in the room, right? because they're trying to reduce their cumulative amount of radiation exposure to something below this threshold of 2 gray. Now, no one should be getting 2 gray immediately with any fluoro procedure, but over 5 or 6 years, could you get this amount? Yes, you could. And so, in this case, we have a deterministic late effect of cataracts being caused by radiation exposure. And so, again, this is going to follow that threshold response, so we've got a threshold of 2 gray, and after this threshold we'll start to see the severity and incidence of cataracts increase. All right, let's talk finally about these gestational or these embryologic effects. We have stages of embryologic development that are essential to understand if we're going to understand how this stuff works and why we ask people questions about is there any chance you could be pregnant when was your last menstrual period the reason I ask people that prior to doing a CT scan the female patients is because if I'm within two weeks of that last menstrual period I'm in this window 
of pre-implantation. So if the radiation affects a developing life in this, in this period, it is pre-implantation that this, the cells have not yet implanted to the uterus, and so the body will just discard that. It is not an abortion. I want to be very clear about this. It is not a radiation-induced abortion. It is pre-implantation. And it will, the body will just discard that. Okay? So it will be a miscarriage? It will be like a miscarriage, yeah. Um, so this is, we would call this intrauterine death. And as grim and grisly as that sounds, that's the reason why we ask them that question. Because if I'm within two weeks of that last menstrual period, then I know that any radiation exposure could not potentially lead to the creation of a life that is going to be impaired by that radiation exposure. Okay? I know that's kind of scary, but this is a critical thing for us to understand. This is why we ask female patients this question. Um, if we are past that window, we definitely need to be considering some kind of exam to determine whether or not this patient could be pregnant. Right? Um, and generally with female patients of childbearing age, we want to get an LMP or some kind of pregnancy test prior to doing any kind of CT exam. With x-ray, I guess it will depend on your facility and what they determine. But after that nine-day window, from about 10 days, so about roughly two weeks to eight weeks, we have a period that we will consider incredibly radiosensitive. So if you forget everything I say about uh, the embryotologic effects of radiation, just remember, two weeks to eight weeks is a big no-no, right? Because what we've got going on in this period is the development of the neurologic system, and the potential to cause all sorts of childhood cancers. The most, as they've indicated over there, the most radiosensitive cells on the face of the planet in terms of human beings is a developing fetus, right? And so an exposure to radiation in the diagnostic range could potentially cause mental retardation or childhood cancer, okay? An exposure to radiation in the diagnostic range could potentially cause mental retardation or childhood cancer. Once we get past that eight-week window in which major organogenesis is occurring, we start to see increased radio resistance within the fetus. So once we get closer and closer to full term, this fetus is incredibly radio resistant now. So, late-term pregnancy, do we do CT scans on pregnant women? Yes, we do. And we shield the heck out of them, and we only scan the area that we're interested in, but we do do CT scans on women to rule out like a pulmonary embolism. Because what we know about pregnant wo women is sometimes they can have increased blood clots in the lower extremities, or could throw a clot up into their lungs, so they're at increased risk for pulmonary embolism, if the, if the lady dies, guess what? She's taking the baby with her. So we're left with this, again, benefits versus risk, a very sticky benefits versus risk thing to weigh. That's why I say, don't forget this foundation. What are the benefits? I can figure out if this woman has a blood clot in her. What are the risks? I need to shield the heck out of her. Right? So, but the nice thing to know is if we've got a woman in the third trimester, that fetus is incredibly radio resistant, and guess what? Mom works as a shield too. She's going to be protecting her child some just with the, her body. This is the reason why in the, in the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the biggest lawmaking regulatory body in the United States, has issued this mandate that for a pregnant woman, her occupational exposure will not exceed 5 millisieverts. You'll notice that that is below the level of what we would assume the collective effective dose is. We said that was 6 millisieverts, right? 6 millisieverts a year is what everyone gets just for living in the United States of America. 
So they've identified an occupational exposure for the pregnant woman, so there's nine months, right, that does not exceed five millisieverts, which is the collective effective dose. It's, it's less than the collective effective dose. Why have they done that? Because, again, they're assuming there's no safe dose of radiation. They are looking at that linear non-threshold model. That is it for today.